Hi, everyone. If you want to grab your seats, uh, just want to welcome you, settle this rowdy bunch here, uh, and welcome you to New America Foundation. Uh, New America Foundation is uh, working in partnership with, with the British Council and through actually Kara right here, who is a veteran from New America who's now moved on to bigger and better things. Uh, but uh, we are working with them to sort of bring, I think, sort of a couple of conversations, I hope, of which this is the first, on topics of interest and of import to our daily lives. And I'm Sasha Meinrath. I direct the New America Foundation's Open Technology Initiative, which is sort of the tech and telecom arm of the Foundation's work. It also does everything from foreign policy analysis to health care reform and education reform work. And today, I think we're going to sort of interrogate and look at some of the notions around this, no this idea of trust. I think most of what we hear is sort of the dystopian future, right? This notion of phishing and man-in-the-middle attacks and identity theft and hackers and, and predators and all of these things that are meant to instill fear. Because this fear-mongering actually sells a lot of papers and gets a lot of eyeballs on a lot of websites. And some of these fears are perhaps well-deserved, but I think tonight we're actually going to invite an illustrious panel of experts to kind of punch through what I see as a lot of the hype around these new technologies. And I hope we'll also be discussing perhaps some of the more democratic and participatory potentials to computer-mediated communications writ large and how trust itself is really a key component of that. So I would argue that connectivity is sort of this force multiplier. It's not a neutral medium, as some people say, but rather it, it amplifies both the, the good, the bad, and perhaps the ugly that might otherwise exist. But on this, on this perfect fall evening, uh, and I'm very happy that we'll be getting out after this uh, to catch a pint, as all you Brits say. Uh, but we've chosen a more optimistic framework, uh, something that where we actually look at sort of discussing what I see as a fundamental tenant to 21st century civil society, which is the trust that must be imbued in the systems, the communications, and what have you that we use every day, every day, uh, to communicate and to build next generation communities. So uh, with that, I'm going to actually turn it over, I think, to Rebecca, who is going to, to give a large-scale introduction, and then we'll have a discussion amongst this panel, and then eventually we'll open it up for Q&A from all of you. So welcome, and thank you for coming out this evening. All right, I'm, I'm trying out my new and exciting iPad this evening, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, but first and foremost, thank you all for attending. My name is Rebecca Zilberman. I manage networks and partnerships here at the British Council in Washington, DC. Uh, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the British Council, we are the UK's international cultural relations organization. We operate in over 100 countries worldwide, and we build trust and create opportunity through our work in the arts, English language, and education and society. And as Sasha mentioned, we're here at the New America Foundation during Digital Capital Week to talk about trust and how the widespread adoption of new mediums of communication may or may not change the way that we build it. I'm sure most, if not all of you, use social media in your daily lives. Um, but how many of you have found it a useful tool to build relationships? Do you think you can use digital technology alone to engage with new audiences? Or are face-to-face -face encounters necessary? I have my own thoughts about these questions, and you may um, as well. After all, you're here tonight uh, for the, the discussion. But first, a bit why I am kicking things off. Um, I manage the Transatlantic Network 2020 project, uh, which is a project designed to reinvigorate the transatlantic relationship by connecting the next generation of influencers across borders. These are young professionals from a variety of sectors who have already exhibited tremendous potential in their careers. Our role is to identify them, bring them together, and then allow them to benefit from the network effect to go out and build on what they've already achieved. In essence, the project is about building a long-term international engagement among individuals, providing members of the network an opportunity to interact not only with each other, but with new ideas, both through in-person encounters and online engagement. A few of them are here tonight, and one, Stephanie Shearholtz, 
um, is one of our panelists. I encourage you to meet them, um, as this network, while small in number, is designed to engage far beyond its membership, which again is in part why we've convened tonight's discussion. Finally, I'd like to thank the New America Foundation for being our gracious host this evening, um, and for DC Week, as well as FutureGov, in uh, presenting this event in partnership with us. Um, before we kick off, a bit of housekeeping. We uh, want to keep the engagement happening both in person and online during the discussion, so we've created a hashtag. That's hash DC2020. Um, and then, of course, after tonight's discussion, we're going to head over around the corner um, for some face-to-face -face engagement at Science Club, where we'll have some food as well as drinks available. So uh, without further ado, please uh, welcome my colleague, Kara Hadge, who's head of digital media here at British Council. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, thank you all for coming. Welcome. We're glad to have you here tonight. We're going to talk for about half an hour, and then we'll open things up for more informal questions. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, we're using the hashtag DC2020, and for those of you who haven't noticed the camera when you came in, this is being live streamed, everything is on the record, and our online audience can use that hashtag to submit questions during the Q&A. We have a stellar panel here tonight. I promise to avoid the space metaphors, even though one of them is from NASA. We'll see how that goes, uh, but let me introduce you to them so we can get started. Deborah Dignam is Digital Advisor for the Arts at the British Council, and she develops digital platforms that expand upon our work in the performing arts. Deborah is also on the Digital Advisory Committee of the Royal Shakespeare Company and a guest lecturer at Goldsmiths. Danny Harris is editor of People's District, which is a local website that shares the stories and photos of the district's diverse residents. Danny also um, manages advocacy and marketing campaigns using digital media for a variety of organizations around the city. And hopefully he'll talk about some of those as well as People's District tonight. And Stephanie Shearholz, in addition to being a TN 2020 member, is social media manager at NASA, where among her many hats, she manages NASA's 250 Twitter accounts, the main one of which has itself nearly 1.6 million followers. Stephanie, that's a lot of followers. <laughs> it is. How do you engage with them, and what's NASA's approach to social media like in general? Well, um, the important thing is to start small, but then to see everybody as an individual, right? So you can't see them as this mass of 1.6 million followers. You have to look at them as individual followers. Um, and what sort of underlies the way that NASA got involved with social media was this mandate that the agency has, which was part of the 1958 act that established NASA, if you're unfamiliar with it, mandated that we communicate what we're doing as widely as possible. We obviously are funded by taxpayers, so it behooves us to tell the taxpayers what's happening with their money and what's going on with the nation's space program and space exploration. So, you know, we've always been involved in getting the word out. You know, during the Apollo program, you could watch the live video feed from the moon, right? So. The web was obviously the next step for us in that, but the web requires people to come to us, and social media allows us to show up in people's other streams in what they're doing. So that was the idea with social media, was to find another way to reach out to people to tell them what they're doing. And the, we just started small. We, we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, we experimented, and Twitter was the first place that we really did that with social media. Now we've have all these accounts, as you mentioned, nasa.gov slash connect is where you can find them all if you want. Um, but we really put a big focus on engaging with people and on answering their questions so that if you tweeted at us at NASA, you had a reasonable expectation of getting a response if it was a real question. And what kind of people do tweet at you? Are they all space enthusiasts? Uh, no, we see a wide range of people. I mean, obviously you're a space enthusiast to an extent if you're asking a question of at NASA. But um, I would say, by and large, we get a lot of followers who are interested enough that the idea of following NASA is appealing, but not necessarily diehards. Now, don't get me wrong, we have diehards. We have uh, groupies, and that's a whole different sort of part of the audience, and you have to talk to them a little bit differently than you do to just the generalist. Um, but we answer a diversity of questions ranging from super te technical type questions to basic questions like, are we still going to the moon? The answer is no. Great. <laughs> so you've talked about getting the word out for NASA mm -hmm. and really trying to get these stories out about the work they're doing. Danny, you've also talked about trying to get the word out, but 
on a, on a smaller scale still to a large audience. Could you tell us a little bit about where the People's District came from and why you chose the medium that you did to get people's personal stories out there? Sure. So I, I moved to the city about six years ago originally to work in terrorist finance at the Treasury Department. And I lived here and I sort of went through the motions of the bureaucratic life and was happily working as a civil servant. But I felt these, these sort of these breaks in the city because I, I felt like in talking to people about the district, they would describe the city that was segregated in so many different ways. It was black versus white. It was northwest versus everybody else. It was federal versus local, punk versus go-go. I mean, you name it, there are divisions in this city. And one day I actually was in a Whole Foods and I had a panic attack. I was surrounded by all these people who were identical to me. We grew up in the same neighborhoods. We were shopping for the same quinoa. We were working in the same kind of jobs. And yet we, not only did we not talk to each other, but we didn't acknowledge each other. And so that evening I made a decision that the way I was going to resolve this, my urban therapy, was that I was going to go interview a stranger every day. I wanted to go and learn about the city, but ultimately to learn about these people who I saw more often than my family who lives in New York. And so it started this process two years ago where I've now interviewed over 700 people and most of them and their stories live on my website, peoplesdistrict.com. But the idea behind it was twofold. One was I started to see that these stories represented a DC that I never understood when I first moved here. It wasn't all about the federal city and it wasn't about the mall, but it was about these rich textures, these human stories. But the other was about interaction. So how could you get these stories to encourage people to meet their neighbors and to realize this wonderful richness that I was experiencing from meeting people with the hope that building this online platform it can encourage people to do the same. Would you say that creating the platform gave you an excuse to go up to people in real life? I think so. I'm, I'm, I've always been a relatively social person, but I, I think you know when I started, there was always this, this fear that I had that people would say, well, you know, who are you and what are you going to do with these things? And, and that did happen. But most of the time, if you go and ask somebody who drives a bus or who collects garbage, tell me about that moment, you know, that, that moment that you decided you wanted to be a garbage collector. Or tell me, what do you understand about the city by collecting its garbage? I mean, how many, how many trash collectors do you think are regularly asked these questions? And what I started to realize was that there was this wonderful value in doing it both for me and, wonder, and understanding all these amazing stories, but also in, in collecting these incredible narratives. And, and I'm a big fan of Studs Terkel, who many of you know is the premier oral historian and his ability of capturing these stories of everyday people and making them so fascinating but also making it so that when you read the story you wanted to go out and, and find your own trash collector to get your own story or you know to understand the story of your mailman so you know everybody has different stories and not everybody said yes but it's been incredibly positive since doing it. And like you said it's underscored different aspects of human experience that everyone can relate to. Mm -hmm. I think, Deborah, you've done some of that in your work, but maybe crossing broader geographical and cultural divides. Um, one interesting project that you've worked on is Gulf Stage. Could you tell us a bit how that crossed geographical boundaries and really brought together different cultures? So, so Gulf Stage was a project that happened um, in October 2010. It happened in Qatar in the Middle East. And essentially, the project was about working with ministries of culture in that region. Um, and they're very interested in how they might sort of innovate in terms of theatre and how they might find an interesting way to bring theatre more so into the mindset of the young people um, and the young generation. And so we worked with them, with our partners in the UK, with a company called Digital Theatre. And what we did was to find a way to capture the theatre of those different countries of the participating festival which was the Gulf Youth Theatre Participating Festival. What was really interesting was that actually for the countries, six countries including Bahrain, UAE, Saudi Arabia, they'd never before experienced something like this. And the intention was that we would capture their live productions, their theatrical productions, translate them all into English and then make them all readily available on a website completely free to view and still there. What was really interesting for the participating countries and also for the ministries of culture was that for once they had a way to actually preserve their cultural heritage. And I think just when we think about technology or the digital space, we tend to think of YouTube and think about viral hits and millions of people watching very fast produced content very quickly. But actually thinking about the digital space and thinking about the future and how you might preserve that is also quite interesting. So those productions are now still available and we worked quite hard to try and 
build a sense of community and as you say to kind of transfer the trust we built in the Middle East and working with the theatre makers working with the young participants and also in the UK with theatre makers there as well um, and sort of one really interesting way that we tried to sort of broker that when we launched was that we launched through Twitter but we linked up with the foreign office the far FCO operational in the Middle East with the British Council extensive global networks and also with young practitioners in the UK and also with our own social media strategists working in the Middle East who also worked for Al Jazeera as well so it was it was a very interesting way to try and see how you could bring that very authentic unique content and how you can share and foster dialogue around that then as well so essentially you networked the network to get out to all these people with these plays when people were responding to the performances, what kinds of audience did you realize that you reached? Were they new audiences to theater? Were they already interested in theater and coming across a new culture for the first time, or both? Um, a really, really um, cross-sectoral audience. Um, what was interesting was that the audience first began, actually, in the Middle East for people who wouldn't normally go to theater. Theater is still a very young art form in many countries there. And they suddenly, by framing the work in that way, by seeing it captured, by understanding that it would be available to view, they suddenly became an audience for their own for their own theatre, which is very interesting. And then also the general audience in that country. But we also had um, people whom we launched on the first day. We had people watching in Japan, people watching in the United States, in Australia, all over the world. And the comments across Twitter and across social media um, in many different platforms were incredibly interesting. And it was a constant flow of English and a flow of Arabic as well. And sometimes they intersected, but it was, it was really exciting to see sort of when you, when you fi finally launched that out there, how the response was so, um, so diverse and can suddenly capture imagination in so many different ways across countries. That's great. Um, one thing that struck me is that, Stephanie, you also mentioned going to where people already are. Deborah, you talked about putting it in a context that's more familiar online versus in a theater. But even if you are meeting people where they're already spending their time online, there's so much content online and people increasingly have the ability to focus in on just what interests them or focus in on things they already agree with. How do you deal with that challenge and what are the benefits of reaching new audiences when you do? Stephanie, maybe in terms of NASA? That's a really good question. Um, it, it is to, to remain relevant within somebody's stream is a challenge. Um, luckily at NASA, we are blessed with very good content. Uh, content is the biggest problem for most people who are entering the social space is how do you determine what, what you have that's valuable and shareable and, and create a niche for yourself where you are a subject matter expert or you have something unique. Well, we have the universe. And we have great pictures and video, and our pictures are our most clicked on content. It's the most retweeted, shared thing. Um, so if you like us on Facebook, uh, you will get our image of the day every day in your news stream. It gets automatically populated. And then if you share it in your news stream, somebody else clicks on it. If they aren't already liking NASA, they'll be taken to a page to like NASA to get the image of the day in their stream. Now the balance, especially with Facebook, is you don't want to be in there too much because you don't want them to hide you, right? But um, you know, with 1.6 million followers, you also have the benefit of we're gaining about 5,000 followers a day. So if I post something multiple times on Twitter, you know, there's always a new audience who hasn't seen it yet. Great. So it's like normal social norms. If you go and meet someone and talk their ear off, they'll be less interested than if you always have something interesting to say. Right? Right. Or well, and we were talking about this yesterday at lunch, the balance of not overhyping, right? So when you're talking about trust, you don't want to be the person who cries wolf on social media, who says, this is the best picture ever, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you do that every day, they're going to quit clicking because they're going to say, OK, yeah, I'm over that. You said that yesterday, and it was a lame picture. So why am I going to click on it today? You, know, you have to have the balance of getting it interesting enough headline that they click on it, but not so much that you're overselling what you're sharing with them. Great. And Danny, this seems to apply to everything you've said, too, in that you're trying to bring stories to people who wouldn't meet the people you're profiling to begin with. Do you feel that you've connected with a new audience? And how did you build a following in the beginning? 
Well, I, I realize it's a strange proposition to start a website about people that encourages people to not read websites and go meet people. So <laughs> sort of with that understanding, you know, I, I can view it in a few ways. One being that there's so many different ways of accessing hyper -local, the hyperlocal world online. You can read blogs, and I think actually what's more interesting than blogs is the comments in the blogs that really provide the insight. And th that, that is sort of the online version of the neighbor on the porch. But what I see where the stories fit in is that they're, they're narratives. So if you've never been to Berry Farms, then maybe you know that your metro will eventually take you there if you got off the green line. If you stayed on the green line and you ended up at Anacostia and you just walked over, maybe you'd recognize the story of the mother talking about her son. The difference is that you just have different tools or different language to describe it. So, you know, I think that they're, they're human stories and that's what people connect to. So the ability of, you know, drawing people in, you know, obviously I used all the tools and I emailed everybody I knew and I told them to email everybody that they knew and then I started to get cross-posting. But what I started to see was that people connected with the stories because they knew the people. They said, hey, every time I go to the 930 Club, there's this big guy with a lot of tattoos who always checks my ID and I've always wondered what his story was. And most people don't ask. So when that story is online, not only are you reading it, but you're sharing it with all your friends who were there with you that night and they say, hey, that's Josh. And these are, this is why he has all these tattoos. And next time we're there, maybe we can raise some of these things, even if it benefits us so we can get to the front of the line. You know, whatever reason it is. But it's these people, these local personalities who are, you know, I used to think there were extras in our lives. But in DC, I see, you know, again, I see these, my bus driver four times a week. That's not an extra. He's like a, a supporting cast. So again, to add these texture to people, there's this, there's this wonderful value. And I think that's partly what it is. And then when you move outside of DC, it's this notion that there are these communities. So if you're a bike messenger, or if you're a baker, or if you're interested in you know, playing street ball, these communities are not limited to just Washington. So when I told the story about Mark, the bike messenger who complained not about email, but about fax machines, and what it meant to bike messengers when fax machines first came out, that story went to Hungary, and it went to Prague, and it went to Kazakhstan, and it went to places where there are bike messengers. And they talk, and they feel like our people. And so that's part of this idea around people's districts. And how do you get a feel for the feedback that people have? Is it mostly through comments on the blog or through social media? It's interesting. Again, I, it, that, that basic sort of challenge that I faced about online versus offline. There was one story that I posted, a girl named Erica, who's a junior at H.D. Woodson Senior High School. And she told this story about how difficult it was to be a student, a black student in an all-black school who doesn't interact with anybody who's white except for an occasional teacher, and how she wanted to be a journalist so she could talk about issues of diversity in school and how this impacts her life. This was her story. And so I cross-posted it, and, and overall there were about 200 comments. And most of the comments focused on, oh, the state of the public schools, or oh, you know, you should be a journalist, but you should really work on your grammar. But then there was one. There was that one person who emailed. So all these 146 comments. There was one email who said, I would like to tutor Erica. Give me her name. I, she, she expresses these challenges. I would like to do something about her. So, you know, there's, for 146, there's one. I mean, my goal in doing this is that there are 146 people who email me or email Erica directly and say, you know, I want to help you in some capacity. I don't expect everybody to go out and tutor somebody or to go meet their neighbors, but the idea that everybody seems a little bit more human and when somebody talks about a challenge in their community or, you know, issues of gentrification, which is the other big one in DC, is you don't start commenting about this and that, but you may go ask your neighbor and say, tell me what the neighborhood used to be like, or tell me a story about the street, or tell me what it means to live in this neighborhood. It, it's not, again, it's not this notion that we all have this huge responsibility, but again, it's trying to change it so that you're not commenting, but you're doing. That's great, and, and essentially you make new connections in the process among people. I think, Deborah, a lot of the work that the British Council engages in has to do with forging those new connections between people, and a couple of the projects you've told me about have done that in new and different ways. How have you reached new audiences for professionals working in the performing arts, not just uh, new audiences for viewing the work? Um, well, I think new audiences is a term in the arts that we use all the time, and it's 
well, what's an audience? Um, what's a new audience? What's an old audience? Which is a really good question to ask. And I think particularly in the digital space, people are very obsessed by the idea of developing these new audiences as if there are millions of people out there just ready and waiting to sort of to come and view what you have. But I think actually by cultivating a digital audience um, as being a new audience, it's just a new way of communicating with that audience. Um, but if you want to actually, as we do sometimes, it's to try and less, when I say create new audiences, it's about the work that we do, how do we share that in a better way? How do we find a new way to make greater impact around that? And how can we communicate that more effectively? So for instance, a project we did this year at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival um, was a project called the British Council Edinburgh Showcase. And we bring together 27 UK artists from the performing arts. And we bring a selection of some of the world's most interesting programmers for the performing arts to Edinburgh. And the idea is they come and they see the live performance. And then they will hopefully bring that work back to their own countries and present that. Um, so it's quite a traditional model in that sense. And previous to this year, it's always been dependent on those people coming. But what we wanted to do this year was to see how we could digitally capture that and how we could share and extend that. And as a result of that, actually bring the effect of that to more presenters, so like a new audience basically in other countries. So we created a series of films around all of those different artists. So it was a snapshot of their work, their practice, and then I interviewed all of those artists about their practice as well. And as any of you know, talking to anyone who makes any kind of creative work, it's very personal, and how you frame that can be so, um, so sensitive. And then once you put that outside to uh, put it on the World Wide Web, basically, how does that then transfer in communication? Do people really understand the context around it? So it was quite a, a sensitive area. So we filmed those productions, put them online, did an extensive social media campaign around that. And then again, through the offices that we have, we emailed all of our contacts in those countries. Our colleagues overseas emailed all of their contacts within those communities. And the idea being that those people who couldn't come to Edinburgh would have a way to understand those theatre productions, have a chance to engage, and also then be able to tune in to a webcast where we brokered down that program as well and, and looked at it in more detail. And through that, we feel that there's, um, it's not just that the audience, the new audience, the professional audience engage with it, but they're continuing to engage all the time because that l showcase still lives as a digital showcase online. And so people can constantly come back to that. And hopefully what will be seen is that in 2011, this is a framing, this is a snapshot of UK theatre performing arts. And what, was the, what are the lasting impacts that you've seen so far in terms of what those uh, video trailers and all the accompanying media that went with them have led to? And we just got a fantastic email the other day from colleagues who are, are running a series of talks in China. <clears throat> and they just did their first talk in Shanghai where they expected to have maybe 20 to 30 professionals who hadn't been to Edinburgh, knew nothing about the Edinburgh Showcase. And were a mixture of people working in the media sector, in the creative sector, so not necessarily performing arts. The event ended up running from being 90 minutes to actually three hours. There were over 100 people in attendance in the room, and they were showing some of the trailers from the Edinburgh Showcase. Um, and that's just one of the serious events they're doing. They're also running in three other cities around China as well. And that's a great way for how that event is properly beginning to network beyond that. And I think that's the real impact that we were hoping to make. Um, so that's continuing in China, and it's planned for other countries as well. So it began with online content and led to offline meetings and engagement and conversations. Exactly. And that's something that NASA does pretty well too, Stephanie, bringing people to experience very new, um, very different things. Could you tell us a bit about your tweet ups and how they got started? Sure. Um, so NASA has started a series of tweet ups. It obviously just started with one. We didn't expect it to become such a thing, um, but we had our 30th tweet up yesterday, and the 31st is two weeks from tomorrow. So uh, it's become quite a big event. Essentially what we did is we offered our Twitter followers the opportunity to come to an in-person event at Na a NASA facility. So um, we held, we advertise it obviously online with social media, particularly Twitter, and then we open a registration period. Anybody who follow us, follows us can register. And uh, then we do a lottery selection from those registrations we get. Those people get invited to come. So we have events that range from 25 people who are invited to 150 people who are invited. And uh, they pay their own way to get there. But then we give them some, si some type of behind the scenes or unique access to NASA or NASA facilities 
NASA experts. So we started small. We started with a two-hour event at NASA headquarters. Um, we had the Hubble repair crew, the astronauts who repaired the Hubble Space Telescope the last time, which was um, what NASA calls STS-125, the space shuttle mission, and also contained the first astronaut on Twitter, Mike Massimino. He's at astro underscore Mike. Um, and so we just put this out there. We only advertised it locally within DC and then obviously on Twitter. And we, we started getting people applying from all over the country. And I started emailing people and saying, um, this is, event is in person in Washington, DC. If you just want to watch online or participate online, you don't have to register for it. And overwhelmingly, the response I got was, no, I'm planning to come. I'll, I'll buy a plane ticket from California. I'll come out. We had a guy from Spain who registered. And wow. he said, I've got my passport. What else do I need? <laughs> And so that sort of blew open the doors for us on this idea of people love access, right? And they, they love the opportunity to encounter NASA. And we have a, a really strong opportunity to expose them to more than they're expecting. So you know they come because they want to meet an astronaut, but they get a broader context of what NASA does across the agency. One of the things NASA has always struggled with is that people have a pretty strong um, positive reaction toward NASA. If you ask most people, they'll say, oh, NASA, that's cool, right? <laughs> but if I ask you to tell me three concrete NASA projects that we're currently working on, most people can't do that. So um, this gives us the opportunity to take that positive interest that they have and translate it into a real experience, real opportunity. They get to interact with astronauts, with scientists, with engineers, with NASA leadership who they would never otherwise get the opportunity to ask questions of, and then see a NASA center. And then so we've grown these into the mega events, which are two-day events that culminate with a launch of a spacecraft. So we did five for space shuttle launches, and we um, have done three more for other spacecraft launches, a mission to Jupiter, a mission to the moon, um, an Earth-observing satellite. And then the next one is Mars Curiosity launches on November 25th, the day after Thanksgiving. And we have invited 150 people to come to Kennedy Space Center to experience the launch and get a behind the scenes tour. And they pay their own way. We just give them access. Mm -hmm. And um, we had 1,000 people register for 150 spots for Thanksgiving week in Florida. So it's pretty cool. And I mean, the communities that have evolved from that, we've had more than 2,000 people participate in these events. We use the same hashtag for all the events. So the community just continues to grow with everybody else who's attended an event. And they have now created Google groups and a Facebook page and a LinkedIn alumni group and uh, Wikipedia pages. And you know they, they actually do a lot of the tracking of the events that I don't have the resources to do. So they built a Wikipedia page that tracks every time we announce a tweet up and who the speakers were, and how many people attended, and what their Twitter handles were. And they do all of that. I don't have the resources for that, but the community does it. And talk about trust. So sorry if I'm, I, I can stop, but I can go on and on, too. Um, Please go on. So uh, with the launch tweet ups, the la typically launches are in Florida. And um, there's not a lot of resources in Florida. I mean, it's, it's a pretty small community where we launch from. And so if we have a really high profile launch, all the hotels fill up with NASA contractors and people who are in the space community. So getting a hotel room, if you're just one of these tweet up participants, can be a challenge if you're not willing to spend a lot of money. So for um, the third to last space shuttle mission, we had a tweet up. And the community decided to rent group houses, right? So they would, rent, they would find, identify a vacation house, and they'd get 10 or 15 of them together to rent a house together. Well, the catch is that n none of them knows each other, right? Mm -hmm. So they are agreeing in, in advance of meeting each other that they'll share a house, that they'll, how they'll split the money, who's going to make the down payment. You know, all of these things, they all arranged on their own. And I, you know, I watched it from afar, and I was sort of like, I would never do that. I would never like <laughs> find 15 people on Twitter and decide to rent a house with them, you know, and, and not know what their personality is until you show up, you know. And maybe they have a really annoying habit, but um, 
it's, it's been remarkable. And so it was, it, most of them had such a positive experience that they told the next group, you know, you have to get group houses. You won't have the same experience, the community experience, if you don't stay together, right? So the, the event is now more than just the event that we host, you know, because they're, they leave us and they go to their group house and they have a bar group party and, you know, it's, it's quite a thing. <laughs> And it's a leap of faith, too, though, for NASA to invite all these people that they don't know. Oh, yeah. Uh, for, been a for a lot government of... <laughs> agency, that seems not only are you the first on Twitter, but let's just invite you all here to our launch, too. What do yeah. the scientists and astronauts think of getting to interact with the public? Well, that has actually been a really interesting journey as well, because in the beginning, trying to convince any of the astronauts or scientists to participate in the event and trying to describe the event in a way that they would understand um, and, and sort of get the idea of just inviting people off the street to come in and ask them questions uh, was a challenge. But it's been so successful that now when we host an event, I get more offers for speakers than I have spots for. So I'll get people from across the agency who say, oh, Stephanie, you're having a tweet up. Do you need, do you need an astronaut to come talk? Mm -hmm. Because I'll come talk to the group. And the thing that is different for them is most of them participate in news conferences. So that's their primary interaction beyond the four walls of NASA. So they're, they're used to dealing with long-term space beat reporters, or worse, a reporter who, whose agency cut their space beat reporter, and so they work on the news desk, but they've been assigned to go do the story on NASA, and they know no, nothing about us. So they ask less intelligent questions of our experts, and so the tweet of participants, on the other hand, before they show up, we say, okay, here's the press kit, here's everything you need to know about the mission, here's the mission's webpage, and they come with these really smart questions, and so our speakers and scientists love them because they're getting asked really intelligent questions about what they're doing, and to the participants who come, the scientists and the astronauts are like rock stars, right? So if, if you're a scientist who's never been noticed for your climate change study, but you know you get in an audience of 150 people who have paid their way and are asking you really smart questions, you feel like a rock star, right? So yeah. it, it's been a cool experience for both sides because it's great for the public to get the opportunity to have the experience of being around NASA scientists and engineers and real rocket scientists. And it's great for the people at NASA who it's so easy to get mired down in the bureaucracy to have interaction with people who are really, truly enthusiastic about what we're doing. So you really are bringing different communities together through these yeah, media. Yeah, Tweeted participants come from all over. I mean, all over the world, all over the country, all, every profession, every age group. I mean, I've seen, I've seen all sorts of participants, which is great. I love that we get a cross-section. That's really cool. Now, Danny, you're trying to get a cross-section too within DC. And other than People's District and the stories you're profiling there, can you tell us about some of the other projects you've worked on that have brought online and offline together in some different ways? Sure. I mean, beyond just documenting the stories, because at a certain point I realized that you know, people were just reading, but how could you actually get them to engage? And so the first thing I did was I built a curriculum for DC high schools with the idea of going in and having students understand how they impact their community. And so we did a number of, of projects, but one of them that I, I thought was maybe the best one to talk about here is, is this question of if, if you had a friend who was coming to visit you and then they were from out of town and 10 minutes before they showed up, you had to leave, but you could leave this map. And this map had the 10 people or places that they needed to know about or they needed to avoid to understand where you live. And so we did this in, uh, over on Benning Road. And it was incredible. I mean, to view the city as a 17-year-old does. So, you know, I get things like, when my mom is home, the best place to make out is at the park behind the rec center. <laughs> or there are these two carryouts next to each other, but don't go to the one on the left because they don't give you enough french fries. You've got to go to the one on the right. So what if you could take that and you could ask a policeman or a mailman or a, a guy who's been hanging out in the corner, how do you build these layers onto the map so that one neighborhood, which is already experienced in you know, thousands of different ways now, has this texture? So that could be one example. I built a branding campaign for the Noma neighborhood out in Northeast. It's a neighborhood that's still up and coming and was really sort of trying to get an understanding of what it means to live there. 
So I went out and I interviewed about 60 people and these words kept coming out. These people felt like they were pioneers for moving into a neighborhood where buildings were still coming up. So took all these stories, built a campaign, but then what we did was we took an unused retail space and we converted it into a neighborhood walk of fame. So if you're ever in no, the Noma neighborhood, it's by the New York Avenue Metro, across from the Harris Teeter, you'll see these 13 photos and stories, and these are these neighborhood personalities, the guy who's run the auto shop for 40 years, or the lady who's at the Harris Teeter, or the guy who cleans the stores. But it's, it's all these people who have this incredible history in the neighborhood, and now we've done work to celebrate them. We're working with the mayor's office to celebrate how the city, or maybe celebrate's the wrong word, to commemorate how the city has grown 10 years after 9-11. So we built a video storytelling booth and started to collect these narratives from people and tied them all together. But the idea here is to create an experience that lives in three places. One is the experience with the person. So that exchange of sharing your story, feeling relevant, feeling like you now are part of something larger. The second is about the curation of taking that piece and then creating something, whether it's a public art project or a video or building curriculum for public schools or building branding campaigns. And then the third one is how it's actually, how people activate it, how they engage with it. So taking things like QR codes, near field technology. Recently I started writing talking points and putting them in bus stops. So with this, this basic question that said, or not question, a statement that said, don't panic, should you find yourself next to a stranger, please consult these talking points. And I put three of them down based on your level if you were a beginner conversationalist, an intermediate conversationalist, or an advanced. And they range from my what blank weather we're having today to hello, my name is, what is your name? But the idea to try to get people talking, because when they talk, it, you know, again, it goes back to that, the thing with Erica. When people start talking, they start to sort of better understand these things that are not about the people that you already know, but the people you don't know. And whether it's the changes in your neighborhood or if you have an elderly neighbor who can't go shopping herself, then at least you know that if you go out on Wednesday, maybe you can go ask her. And, you know, it's again, it's sort of, it's adding this richness to yourself and this richness to your community and finding ways of taking the stories, taking the experiences, and taking them offline so that they're in people's everyday lives. So it's very much a multi-layered experience, it sounds like. And that's, that's something that comes in with the work that you do, Deborah, as well. Um, you were telling me about one project, Connected, that introduced new ways of people getting to know one another and interacting more deeply than before. Can you tell us what Connected was and, and how it surprised you and how it played out? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's important to say, first of all, that like a lot of the work that I'm doing as well is with a performing arts community or with artists as well, and generally it tends to be a little more niche. So it's always a challenge to see how can you create some kind of understanding around what that is, and then also how can you bring a wider audience in. So the Connected Showcase was a showcase of interactive performance that happened in Tokyo um, two years ago now. And what was interesting about that was that we brought together a group of artists who never would normally identify themselves as being interactive artists. But there was a showcase that I curated, and it was a combination of artists who either made work using technology or were influenced by technology as well. Um, and what was sort of really interesting when they came together as a group of people, they sort of, first of all, they said to me, the artist said, you know, sort of like, are you mistaken? Do, do you understand the kind of work that I make? Am I really the person you need on this? And but by coming together and understanding each other's practice, they really then began to understand actually what was shared about it as well. So I think it was a whole new way for them to begin to look at each other. And what we did also, one of the pieces that really comes to mind is one of the artists called Duncan Speakman. And he makes um, it's audio performances. And it's, it's quite sort of interesting in terms of the work that you're doing as well, Danny. It's, it's about taking public space and trying to find new ways to interpret public space. So we had a social media community that operated, first of all, around that artist. And you could log on to that community and download an MP3 file onto your own personal iPod or whatever player you have. And then you listen to that. And that's your way in, first of all, to what this piece of work is. But then when you get to, or in Tokyo, the audiences in Tokyo were able to experience that performance on the streets. So what it meant was that for people who previously had no idea who this artist was, suddenly were part of a social media community and were talking and discussing and learning more about these artists, then listening to that on their MP3 pair, and then also in the street at a particular time in the evening, it was programmed between 6 and 7 p.m. So actually the image was there earlier, um, and people could actually listen to that together, and suddenly you had this very 
sort of online experience become a very rich offline experience where people shared in something as collective. And what was really interesting was that obviously within Japanese society that sort of personal body contact can be quite limited. And one of the key parts in the performance was where at a certain moment the audience were sort of split in two. So different groups of people were moving through the city listening to different parts of the audio and then came together at a certain point and were suggested that they would hug the person across the street. So it was quite choreographed and people actually hugged. So that was where that image is from of people actually hugging in the street in Tokyo. It was a very different way for people to understand how, what that sort of art is but also how those artists then themselves identified themselves as well through that. Great. I have one last question before we open up the Q&A and this is really because we're here at New America, where questions about access to technology have taken place on this stage many, many times. Um, do you all feel that the new communities that you're trying to reach have access to the tools they need to engage in these online spaces? Or are there people that still need to be brought into the discussion? Danny, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, th you know, I think the oral, the oral tradition and you know, sto joke around that storytelling is the world's second oldest tradition. Um, so the concept that it's, it's relatively new or that we don't know how to engage with it is obviously, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that the challenge is how to get people to tell stories. Maybe it's how to get people to connect. And, you know, I was talking to somebody yesterday and they were saying, you know, what's, does it matter? And, and maybe that's another question. Like, does it matter to people to know their neighbors? Does it matter to people to have these interactions? And, you know, I would say that I think it matters when you see that there's a value added. I, I came from a quantitative background in graduate school, so as much as I love stories, I also view things in charts and, and curves and start to see where you can start to see that there's a value from it. So however you want to look at these things, I think that there is a significant value to it. And, you know, I would hope that people on all sides will use it. And if, if I stopped doing this tomorrow, people would still sit on their porches and tell stories. The question is, would people sitting on porches across the street from each other tell stories? And I don't know how much of an impact I have there, but I'd like to hope that through reading these stories, people feel more encouraged to engage with people around them or to go and talk to people that they don't normally talk to. Okay, That's a good note to wind up this conversation with, I think. Now, we'd like to invite all of you to ask your questions. Because we are recording this, I'd ask that you wait for the microphone, and Tom will bring it around to anyone who has a question. I've got a question here from Twitter. Um, it's from um, Rhett Rothberg. He asks, um, and the question is directed to all of you, can government agencies that don't launch fun rockets use Twitter in effective ways? <laughs> so I guess that question would probably be for Stephanie. Well, um, Rhett is one of our tweet attendees. He's been to one of our events. Um, actually, though, I've been invited to speak about what we do at social media and you know, to other government agencies and to other companies. And uh, one of our previous TweetUp attendees, David Rosen, who's also a, a social media strategist, um, made a very astute comment, which I rip off and use in almost all my presentations, which is that even if you don't have rockets, you have a fan base and you have a community, and it's your job to bring that community together. And so you, know, you have to think about it that way. You have a niche. You have groupies. You have people who are interested in what you do. Everybody does. And so, um, or who, who consider themselves experts in your area. And it's your job to sort of connect them and to find them and bring them together. And you know, with the tweet ups, one of the things that we've seen is that it really does give people a sp safe space to be a space nerd, right? So there are a lot of people I encounter at the tweet ups who say, oh yeah, I was always interested in space, but you know, I did something else for whatever reason. And it's cool to, to come sort of back to space and get reconnected with my interest in it and to meet all these people who also like space, right? So we, we bring them together and then they can talk about space together and follow it. And, and that's where we've seen the biggest conversion rate actually is, you know, people who just followed us online previously, they come to an event, they meet other people, they experience space in person then they become advocates on our behalf to the point where we don't even have to do the work anymore. They're doing it for us. And then you can help meet some of that digital online offline world where they are going back to their communities and talking about their experience in person to the people that they're encountering, not just online. 
Thanks, Ryan. Um, my question was about People's District, um, and just you talked about the divide within the district. Um, and I was curious if you know sort of how much your website is bridging that divide, or whether the people that are following you are mostly the same people who you were shopping in Whole Foods with, particularly given that a Washington Post columnist referred to Twitter as specifically associated with gentrification and the Northwest community, mm -hmm. and not with some of those other communities um, that may not, you know, trust the medium itself. I mean, it's a it's a great question, and you know, I view it as I only know the the output by what people tell me. So I get these emails all the time from people who are you know over the age of eighty, who either they'll write themselves or they want somebody close to them will write and say, "I've lived in the district for so long," and usually the emails are like this: "I never knew that." fill in the blank. So I never knew that there was this last Jewish deli outpost on Bladensburg Road. I never knew that there was still a place where you could get Italian bread on North Capitol Street. A lot of it, it doesn't necessarily relate to the people, but relates to what they say. Because they're these, I mean, they're not hidden communities, because obviously people know about them. But So for example, if you, I, I interviewed the head of the Republican Party in DC. And people wrote to me and they said, I had no idea that DC had Republicans. And this was a serious, <laughs> These are serious emails, you know? Like, thank you for telling me that we have. So, you know, there are people in other cities that reach out to me and they'll say, you know, I'd like to start a version of this in my city. And, and other people around the district, they tell me that too. And I think it's wonderful. I have, you know, I, I don't, I, nobody should have ownership over stories. And I certainly don't ever want to feel like People's District is, is the only platform. But I would hope that more people do it. So I view my input in terms of people read it, they follow it, they comment, they send ideas. People in other cities, they want to start their own projects. And, you know, I, I would like to hope that one day People's District is that idea of the one city that Mayor Gray talks about or people like Kojo Nandi speak about on the radio program every day. But it's, it's not there yet, and it's, it's growing. And, you know, again, it, the idea is that hopefully everybody will take a little bit of this concept with them, and then it'll help make the city the kind of place that, you know, hopefully all of us want it to be. I have a question on the NASA experience, which I find extremely impressive. Um, implicit in the approach you've taken is that uh, it's a very transparent uh, process. The good, the bad, and the ugly all come out. Um, with that in mind, my experience with agencies and the private sector as well is uh, that there is this um, particularly among public relations folks, and you are not in public Actually, relations. I well, I, I consider it more in, co in communication because when I describe my experience with public relations, you may not want to <laughs> acknowledge that, uh, that controlling the message right. is the number one mantra, controlling the message. Uh, so I was wondering, within NASA, have you encountered that uh, tension between the need uh, among some public relations people to, and, and their leaders within the agency, to control the message versus your efforts to open up the agency to a more transparent and open process? There's definitely been periods of tension. Um, the, the good news is that NASA has a long history of being open and broadcasting what we're doing in real time with very tricky stuff. You know, space flight is not easy. It, it, it does, even though we've been doing it now for quite a while, it's still in a test project sort of perspective. So it, it definitely varies across the agency. Um, I've been lucky enough that a lot of what we've been doing with the tweet ups has been in the human spaceflight area. So the space shuttle launches, we invited people to five different space shuttle launches. And the space shuttle program has had experience with very visible public reactions to tragedy. And so uh, they have become very open about addressing that and dealing with it. And that, that was very helpful in the way that we shaped the tweet ups because when you're inviting 150 people to a space shuttle launch that may or may not happen, um, or may or may not happen on schedule, um, we, we actually joke about the tweet ups. Uh, I usually, in my shtick, say that they range from two hours in length to two days. Well, we had one tweet up uh, almost a year ago 
uh, it was actually more than a year ago for the launch of um, the last mission for Discovery, Space Shuttle Discovery. It was supposed to launch on November 1st. It launched on February 24th. So I describe that as the 115 day long tweet up. Um, we only made a promise to those people that they would get to come for the initial experience and that's actually one of the reasons why it's a two day event. On the first day they get the program, they get to interact with the astronauts, and then the second day is the launch. So we want to give them enough good content and a great experience on the first day that if it doesn't launch on time, on the second day they can still walk away going this was worth it, it was worth it to come. Um, so we've had a lot of experience with that. I've had to replan events in real time. Yesterday, actually, at the tweet up, it was at NASA's Langley Research Center, which is about three hours away from here. And the concluding event of the tweet up was a drop test for the Orion capsule, which is the new capsule we're working on to go back out beyond Earth orbit. And uh, the video, I, I was watch I didn't actually get to attend yesterday. So the video, you know, the capsule is pulled back, on, and they let it go and it drops into this basin of water and you watch as the, the capsule capsizes, right? And so you hear the audio of, oh, oh, oh no, oh, that doesn't look good. You know, but this is how we do things in real time and we test, you know, this is why we do tests. So it's, it's a good experience, you know, I've had to say on a number of occasions, I'm really sorry, space flight is hard and it, that resonates with people and it actually does help us get out that message, right? Does that answer your question? Well, I'm sure the participants love it. It's really a question within the agency uh, that's the tension among the administrators particularly. Well, and like, like I said, it sort of varies. Um, right now the administrator is an astronaut and so he's a little bit more comfortable with that on the level of you know, having people there in real time. Uh, the argument that I have typically made is um, when, you know, le leadership has said, well, aren't you concerned about what these tweets are going to be saying in real time, what they're going to be tweeting out? What if I say something that I shouldn't or whatever? And uh, I always tell them, well, you know, you talk to reporters. We don't control what a reporter writes in a newspaper any more than we control what somebody tweets when they're coming to an event. And actually, by and large, the experience has shown that tweet up participants are much more enthusiastic and supportive than reporters are. So, um, you know, it, it's still that same level of you have to give up the control at some point and you have to recognize that. And so, you know, the best you can do is be well prepared to begin with. I think there was a question in the back. Yeah, I have a question. Some of you have described various projects, the art projects or the group housing rental or the storytelling in the neighborhoods and the local interaction even between strangers. What do you think are the conditions under which strangers, people who have never met each other before, will trust each other? Um, particularly, you can say that people will trust others within a particular community mm -hmm. when the only method of communication is 140 characters or less. Um, how do you think the trust is built? What are the conditions under which people will trust each other in such a large distributed setting, uh, whether for arts or for uh, you know, hugging each other on the street when that's against the social norm, renting a group house together, things like that that require trust? <laughs> well, I would say from the arts perspective that definitely nothing brings people together like really good art. Um, and that then transfers very much online. I think there's no difference between online and offline. So whether it's watching a piece of theatre that is in Arabic, which has been translated into English and comes from a country that most people probably will never go to, Saudi Arabia, and if that's a good piece of content, then I think people have a natural understanding. And they've begun, there's something, then the condition is that there is a shared um, interest, and then there becomes a shared understanding. But ultimately, it's not about forcing people to talk about each other. It's about talking about something first and then being able to evolve that into a conversation. So much in the same way that when we network offline as well, when we go into a room, it's usually more difficult to start talking to each other at each other. It's much better to talk about the coffee you're drinking or the talk you've been to. And um, I think that very much is a condition, particularly in arts, where we'll go to the theatre and we'll come away from a piece of music and we'll talk about what we've seen because we've experienced something together. And I think that very much for online space is about shared understanding. 
I would say, I mean, I think that obviously art is a part of it. You know, your team winning the Super Bowl or winning some big event. You, you look at um, Obama's inauguration, everybody gathered on 14th and U Street, whether you for or against him, but the notion that it brought people together. But actually, I think that what brings people together more is unfortunately the negative. So there was an, uh, you know, an earthquake in DC and everybody in my apartment building ran out and we all stood there together and now we were all residents of the same building who had gone through the same experience and started asking each other, are you okay? Did you, did, I know there's a woman who lives on your, on your floor, did you make sure she got out? Or you know, I was on an Amtrak train and we stopped in the middle of Delaware and I'm sitting with a bunch of suits and everybody's on laptops and nobody wants to talk to each other and then we run out of power and now everybody wants to start talking. It's the same, I mean, I was in New York on 9-11, these same things happen, so you know, you can, I don't know if, if the, the Super Bowl win or the flash mob is the equivalent of the negative, but unfortunately the way I've seen it is that it's these things, it's this uncertainty, it's where people are challenged and it's sort of the, the opposite side of, of the good that creates the circumstances for people to hug one another on the street or to help a stranger or, you know, my grandmother who's 88 on 9-11, she was basically carried home by a busboy, you know? These kind of things happen. They wouldn't happen normally, so. I think it's the shared experience. You know, what we've all de described is there's some, something initially that sort of breaks the ice and brings you together into a community and then you have, from there you can have a shared experience. And obviously for, for different people there are different levels. I would never rent a group house with 15 tweet up participants that I didn't know. Um, but you know, so that, that's a comfort level by individual as well. But I think it starts at that shared experience of the recognition that we have something in common. Um, there's uh, this guy, the Twitter account is Gaping Void and he talks about social objects and I think that's what these are, shared experience. They're social objects. And we trade them just like we do real objects, but social objects are you know, traded. They're traded experiences and stories and those types of things. But I guess it, sorry, just, I think it has to be something a little bit more than that. Because there's so many things that we share. I mean, I don't, I don't know most of you, but you know, we share that you know, we, we moved to Washington for one reason or another, and that was to work. You know, then there's a preposition in government and around against in spite of. So there's something that connects us. I mean, there's, I, I think there has to be. Well, but yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying. That, that's what breaks the ice. But then if you see a launch together, you know, you're part of this group that you all experience this launch. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, like you said, something, it doesn't always have to be negative, but something big, something meaningful that happens that you all, that you share that experience. And what's the point when things break? Because we can all be in a collective experience and be very engrossed in something, but what's, what's that little thing that breaks and makes you actually turn around to the person beside you and say, wow, it's amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because too often you can stand, particularly living in, in the UK, actually, you're on the tube, and it always fascinates me how it's just deathly silent all mm -hmm. the time. And even the, you know, the day after the UK riots just recently, it was even quieter the next day. I was quite surprised that nobody would touch out, reach out and say, how do you think it was last night? And it just doesn't happen. So there's something that sort of happens within us where I think the experience has to be bigger than us or is a disruption to the norm or it's just something that takes us outside of ourselves, which makes us lose that sense of risk really and actually reach out to somebody and not be afraid of the reaction we might receive and I think there's a really interesting thing about taking that online because yes of course you can reach out really quickly but what's going to be the breaking point there because you can't see the person so you can't really relate to the reaction until the reaction has actually gone out um, and it's something I'm kind of interested in the idea of digital shyness in terms of at what point some people are really good at sort of really broadcasting and then other people take a lot of time and they need to build trust again and then find a way to connect with you. Yeah. I think there's a question up here. <laughs> thank you. Uh, it, first of all, thank all of you for this is a very positive, optimistic conversation. And toward that end, and, and being in the other Washington, Danny, in terms of the federal government and the the, the, the nature of the political discourse today. I'm wondering if there are things here that we're learning that we could host a new kind of discussion and bring people together who have legitimate concerns about governing, but we, 
the nature of the dialogue doesn't seem to get us to where we want to, to get to. So the Tea Party on the one hand, Occupy on the other, the political parties in Congress, in your words, do you have any thoughts or advice in terms of cur curating a new kind of conversation mm -hmm. that can resolve problems and come to new solutions? Um, a disruptive innovation to the way we are conducting our governance, not only in this country, but globally, too. I'd just be interested if you have any thoughts or ideas sure. on that. Thank well, I'm you. working. And all to, of you, too. Yeah, well, I, I'm currently working to solve the DC race problem, so let me <laughs> deal with that first, and then we'll move on to the states. It probably shouldn't be that big of a leap. But I think you're exactly right, and in, in, in I think that part of it is that. There's just, we've just sort of moved so far away from each other. And again, to take it to a DC angle, I mean, part of the reason that I freaked out at Whole Foods was because if I couldn't talk to somebody who was I identical to me, al almost identical, what, what chance did I have of connecting with somebody who was not like me? And so that's how I went off to do it. And I think partly what I came to learn is that with everything you read, unless you're fluent in the people who are familiar with that or who have experienced it, you lack something significant. So again, gentrification, my neighborhood's changing, I can read everything I want in the Washington Post and local blogs, but the truth is that Ms. Taylor, who lives downstairs, she'll tell me a different story. And it may not be the right story, it may not be the only story, but it's a story and it's a face and it helps to add context. So, you know, I think with the Occupy and the Tea Party, I, I just feel like there's, you know, we, we can live in an NPR world and watch Jon Stewart and drive Volvo station wagons and eat sushi and do all the things that we're supposed to being on one side and you can do everything you're supposed to on the other side. But again, when you lack that ability of not making it an issue, but it's a person. So the issue of abortion is no longer everything that relates to religion, everything that relates to that, but it relates to the experience of somebody who's gone through it. Or, or the 1% is this guy I used to live next to. And so now when I read about this, I can compare it into that way. And I think that when these social issues, they just become so divisive, I almost want to just start asking these people, tell me somebody, tell me, talk to me about somebody. Don't make it about an issue. Tell me how this has impacted somebody you know, or tell me the story as it relates to this, whatever issue you want to talk about. And then let's make it not about that, but let's make it about the person and what you've learned from that person. And I don't think it's going to solve all these issues. But again, when it's not about Republicans and Democrats, but it's about my neighbor, it's about the guy who lives down the street, and it's about their ideas and their policies and their views, then it makes it much more personal to us. Again, thanks so much for this talk. It's really great. Um, I'm working in the government as well, and I belong to an interagency community of practice. And we were all sitting down talking about um, community management. And uh, can you build a community, or are you always starting from a group of people that already existed sort of offline? Um, and we determined that it was easier, right, if you have a group of people who already get together offline. But um, I guess I'm interested in all of your thoughts. If you're trying to build a community online, what are some tips and tricks if the group already exists, if the group doesn't already exist, in getting people together? Um, what are maybe some of your failures that you have learned from? Um, and then a, a tag-on question for Danny, back to, to politics. Have you ever thought about um, leveraging the People's District to get D.C. voting rights? Because I, I feel like people don't know the story, that, that the District of Columbia has people in it, not just the capital. Right. <laughs> or just evil Washington. Right. Do you want to start? How do you feel about voting rights? Sure. So, <laughs> I mean, I think this has also been a big learning curve for me. So when I started, I didn't realize how the lack of voting rights would actually impact people on a regular basis. So DC lacks a federal penitentiary. If you're locked up, you can be sent to North Dakota, you can be sent to Colorado. Many people know about the issue relating to the, the lack of funding for needle exchange programs, which is partly to blame for DC having the largest HIV crisis in the nation. It's actually a level that's higher than many places in West Africa. But the, I mean, the list goes on and it relates to issues of infant mortality, African-American women with breast cancer. I mean, you start to see that DC is great in so many ways, and it's also great because it has, it's, been a fail, it's been a failure to so many of its people, its most vulnerable. So I find these stories and I tell them. Um, but what I think is interesting is, when you look at what the threshold is in our society now about interest, and that is a like button, which means almost nothing in the world. You click, you like something, and it means that something shows up in a stream that you check on a regular basis that you can now hide. 
And how many people like DC vote? Or how many people gather online in this most simple way to say, I live in DC. I spend my days working to bring about change for, for the whales, against the whales, in spite of the whales, whatever reason you're here for. It's clear that people are politically active and they can make change. But there's not this investment here to say that while I'm here, I'm going to invest in the fact that I am an American living in our nation's capital and I'm not able to full voting rights. So I think we need to start with, you know, that basic question of how do, we, how do we get people talking about it? How do we get people to like something? And then beyond that, I mean, I worked at the Treasury for three and a half years. Never once did people gather outside of the White House and say, I live in this city and I should be voting. I mean, we should all care about that issue. I mean, many of us are going to be transients and we'll stay and we'll go. But while we're here, it seems to be something that we should care about. So these stories draw the attention to the people who every day are, are struggling with this issue of the lack of statehood with the hope that people will they'll learn more and then hopefully they'll do something about it. And the first part of your question was best practices for bringing online communities from offline ones. Deborah, you have any thoughts on um, Yeah, we sort of, um, through all the projects that I've done, we build, we build communities and what we've learned, first of all, to give you a mistake or a, a failure, but it was a test, so I think it's good to fail sometimes, um, is that basically building something around time-based events can be a very costly um, process and doesn't always deliver what you want as well. I think the first thing to do about building communities, why are you building it? For what purpose? To what end? Um, and also if you build it, what will happen when it flips out of control and becomes super successful and you end up with sort of a huge community of people that you suddenly realize you don't have the resource to maintain them. They have an expectation around you. You have nothing more to give them. The event's over, the project's over, the mission has changed, the message has changed, whatever it is. And I think if you're building community, you need to take responsibility for that community before you begin. And I think people too often think, oh, let's quickly set up the social networks. They can all be done in an afternoon. It can all be up and running, but what does that really mean? And what are you trying to say? So I think it's just the, it's the offline questions that you ask which really deliver the online results. Stephanie, you're part of an active online and offline network with TN2020. How does that work where you all meet together offline only occasionally, but you're pretty active online? Yeah, well, so um, in the TN2020 group, it brings together people on both sides of the Atlantic and um, young people who are engaged and active. And um, I think partly what helps is we have this really intense bonding experience, right? So we we have an in-person event where we all meet each other and have a few days together to talk about really important issues. Um, we, the summit is always focused around some interesting or thought-provoking issue. Uh, and, and so we all come from different backgrounds and we have this intense experience together and then you connect. And obviously with some people, the connection continues pretty strongly and with others, it sort of fades away a little bit. But um, you know, I, one of the things I love about TN2020 is that when I get up in the morning and I look at my Facebook stream, it's all people in Europe and across the rest of the world who are in the middle of their day or at the end of the day. And so I stay much more connected to what's going on from a worldwide perspective instead of being so just US centric. Um, you know, even the, the nightly news here is so focused on the US and world news is, you know, what, 30 seconds of the newscast. So, to me, all those people have become my world news. Um, and so they have become the way I connect to really from a, I know somebody there who's experiencing that and they're my friend to some degree. And so it makes it more real and more personal to me to be connected to them. And then we do, you know, people, let the, the good thing about being in DC is people come through here. So, you know, when they come through the States, they, you know, they'll take a visit and, and we'll have a bunch of us, we'll get together and, and talk. And you know, usually there's somebody brings somebody else who's part, not part of the network. And so it sort of just grows this community, which is great. There are a couple here. Centel. Is anyone else here? Oh, Marsha. Yeah, so great. Good people. Yeah. We have another question somewhere. Uh, isn't your definition or you, you, the way you use the word trust is a little nebulous because all the examples you give are sort of self-selected. You know, people select in to do what you want and, and then they go away. So that of course they would tend to 
have some affinity with the other people who d selected the same thing, right? You know what I'm trying to get at, right? And it looks like the people in the NASA, well, they're interested in outer space, right? They all come in and, and the other people. Although the interesting thing um, with the tweet ups is, is there tend to be a lot of people who register from the tech community, but not necessarily the space community. So they hear from, a te from their tech friend. Uh, we have a lot of people who work at Twitter who register for our events, um, and, which I think is great. But so we, I, I think it's more broad than you would think just from a space community. More as the tweet ups have continued, more and more people have told me they registered because they knew somebody who attended one and they had such a great experience, not because they, were, they themselves were a space nerd. So um, I have said, I've been known to say before, you know, we don't expect you to be a space geek when you show up, but we hope that you'll be one when you leave. Um, but the trust thing is, is actually really interesting because we are literally inviting people from Twitter to come in person to NASA facilities at you know, high risk times like launches. And we are giving them access to NASA centers at, the, at Kennedy Space Center. They have the ability to drive themselves to and from the press site. This is a secure NASA facility. Now, they do have to go through an additional check before they come, but we essentially give them rules. And we are trusting that because they are getting this sort of privileged access, that they will respect those rules as a result of getting this access, knowing that if they break the rules, that could affect the whole community. Uh, it, it could affect our ability to host an event again. It could affect um, you know, their, the, their fellow participants. We have had rule breakers, and we've had to deal with that. But thankfully, the community helps self-police, right? So enough people have a common interest in everything going well that they will, you know, I, don't ha I have to do very little of it. You know, there are enough people in 150 who are rule followers who will tell the others to follow the rules, right? So um, that helps, but it is, I mean, I, I live in fear of the day that one of the tweet up participants does something terrible. And we do things like we went to Wallops Flight Facility and we checked out the Taurus II rocket that Orbital Sciences is building. And we went into a room where we couldn't have any electronic transmitting device, right? Because we could blow up the rocket. So I'm taking 50 people into a room and trying to make sure that none of them has a key fob that, or a Blackberry or an iPhone or anything that is transmitting and knowing that if they do, this could end very, very badly for me and for the whole community, right? That's trust to me. Any other questions? I think we'll take one more. Hi. Uh, a lot of what you guys have talked about is about bringing people from behind a computer screen out into mm -hmm. the actual outside world and meeting and everything. Do you foresee that as the future of social media and the way people interact with all of these online? Or is it still keeping people behind their computer screen? Deborah, what do you think? Um, I don't think it's an either or, really. I think it's, um, I think social media and digital, is, it's a new communication tool for us. It's a new tool in many different ways, it shapes and means. But I don't think it's an either or. I think that we're, we increasingly live in a society where we have choice. Um, and we have choice whether we want to participate offline, because we can choose it if we want to. I think increasingly people are looking towards the more zen aspect of being totally plugged out. And supposedly in the future, well, I think very soon, that we'll move towards wanting to go on holidays where we'll be completely plugged out, where we'll have no contact, there'll be no connectivity. But I don't think that we need to make decisions, certainly not if we're people who are managing communities or trying to bring people together, that we will decide to have either offline or online activity. I think you really strengthen both if you bring it together. And it's about going back to that point, point of really trying to find where people are at and finding where people are comfortable. And so it's not about enforcing something upon them, it's about giving them a way to give them access to what it is that you're doing, but to make a very comfortable route for them. And usually that route tends to be quite circuitous, where you may meet them online or you may meet them offline, but generally things will interweave and it'll become more cyclical. Yeah, I agree. I mean, my, 
you know, my idea is that one day, you know, social media 3.0 or 4.0 will just be the table and chairs. And that'll be what we go back to. And, you know, if I became mayor or a benevolent dictator, what I would do is just put a table and chairs on every street corner of a city. And I would, you know, so many cities are thinking creatively about how do you bring people together through public art or through public space. But this notion that, again, I think that there's so many values. And you look at these communities of people who thought that they were alone, or pe individuals who, who thought they were alone, and then they f find their people online, and then they get together. So, you know, all those things are wonderful, and, and I don't want to downplay them, but, you know, I, I would love nothing more. And the happiest times in my life are sitting around tables with food and with things to drink with people that I know and some people I don't, and with the hope that we somehow move back into that direction. And maybe that will, will be what the response is when you have 84 accounts you need to follow and 17 Twitter feeds or 250 Twitter feeds and all these other things. And maybe that'll just be how we slowly respond to it. I, I agree. I think it's a circle, you know, that, that y you are online and you are offline. That's the same way you are with your family and your friends and, and all of those people. One of the interesting things that we've seen with the tweet ups for some of them, we've allowed people to bring guests, and for some of them, it's been your registrations for you only. So you you were the only person. Um, and the the thing about the the events where we don't allow people to bring guests, they come in as single people, right? And they don't know anyone. If you bring a guest, you have sort of a comfort level. If you're coming with somebody you know, who you're friendly with, you have less incentive to reach out and talk to other people around you. So the, the, I think the more rich in engagement experiences are those for which we don't allow guests because everybody comes is alone and they all have to meet somebody and they have to talk to somebody. And one of the things that we do with the tweet ups is we spend an hour, an hour and a half passing around the microphone saying, tell us your name, tell us where you're from, tell us what you do, and one interesting thing about you. And that's my favorite part, is hearing people say w what their one interesting thing about themselves is, and then watching the connections happen within the room. Right? So these people are connected before they show up. They know who else is coming, but they don't know about that person. And then they show up, and they're like, oh, I went to that school, or I do that as a hobby, or you know, those sorts of things, and that's what makes the connections. And then they go away with a friend, and then, you know, they walk away from the event, and they have this buddy that they've experienced it with. It's really cool. That is a great go ahead. I was just going to say one more thing in terms of the offline, online, even though we're using the term, I mean, I really think it's going to become an obsolete term as well. If you think about if you were to talk to any six-year-old, and ask them the difference between online and offline. I mean, it used to be digital natives, but now it's just getting younger and younger and younger in terms of there will be no difference to someone. It's just a way of being. And going back to the table, it's like, well, we're still human. So we may have this, you know, and even the sort of the fact this is the panel about trust through technology. Trust is a human value, and that will always rule a day, and I hope it rules a day. It's the world I want to live in, certainly. And so I think we'll take that to every choice that we make in relation to technology. That's a great note to end on, I think. And going on Stephanie's point about meeting people you don't know, please join us, all of you, around the corner. We're headed to the Science Club now on 19th Street, where we have platters of appetizers waiting and drink specials just for us. And there are a few technology-related groups there that may join our ranks as well tonight. Um, my colleagues will lead you around the corner there if you're not familiar, so please congregate by the elevators. And thank you all so much for coming tonight.